biologist, I'm a, I'm, I work as a science, a science uh, researcher and teacher in this university. And I'm not going to tell you anything about biology today. But um, I'm happy about these uh, three rules, right? Socrates' three rules, because I want to tell, I want to tell you in the next um, um, 16 minutes, um, actually fit all three rules. I, I passed all three rules, so I, I, I'm allowed to tell you this. So, um, the talk before me by Suzanne what was great, wasn't it? Um, it's about curiosity, it's about how to make children grow up with love and um, care. Um, my talk is actually follow up with the same, th uh, same, uh, same theme. Um, it's actually about um, education and curiosity. Before I'm um, getting there, I'm going to learn from Suzanne's talk and do the same thing. And, uh, and the same thing is for, for you to close your eye for one second. Was it one second or five seconds? Whatever, close your eyes. And um, imagine a specific moment in your life that happened to you in the past. Um, I, don't know, I, I don't know about you. I don't, anything, I don't know anything about you or most of you. But I'm guaranteed that that thing has happened to you sometime in the past. So close your eye and uh, imagine that you are small, small, small kid. Um, a few years old, five years old, younger than five years old, and you um, life was good, wasn't it? Uh, you don't need to work, and um, really, you, um, everything in the world around you is new, and you're full of questions, and, and there are adults around you, and they are all um, very keen on answering your questions, and whatever you ask, they got the, um, the answer immediately. For example, um, you, 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 you didn't know what the switch is for, and then immediately your father tells you the switch is for that lamb over there, um, and uh, what is a uh, cabinet uh, in, in the kitchen does, your mother will tell you, you know, it's a fridge and there are lots of good stuff inside. Um, where a baby come from and oh, they all fell from the sky. So basically, um, you don't answer right away. But that particular moment that I want you to revisit now is actually a little bit different. And in the, at that moment, not just before that moment, um, you came up with a question. And that question, just like all the hundreds of questions you asked before, to you, it's just another question, right? You just, you just want to know something. Why is water wet? Um, why are all the remote control designed in the same way? Why, why are they all black, for example? Um, but, but on that day, at that moment, something is different. The person you ask this question, either he or she is in bad mood, or he's a bad person, or it's just a wrong time. This time, you, get, you didn't get the answer. That person, probably your parent, but almost certainly, a teacher, instead of answering your question, he would say that um, you shouldn't ask this question. This question is um, a waste of time. Um, I think you should focus on something more important, for example, your study, instead of wasting my time asking such a silly question. Or um, a slightly better person would have said that, oh, this question's um, difficult. It's too difficult to you. It's too small. You're, you're too small. And um, there are people like scientists they're very, very clever, and they will figure out that out for you in future. So you, you don't need to worry about it. Now, please go back and do whatever you want to do, um, maybe especially doing that exercise and you want to, uh, because you want to pass the examination. That's the moment I want you to think about. I don't know about you, but personally, I think this moment um, is very, very common. Uh, this, per this moment is probably one of the most important moments in your life. So, um, this, we know that this moment happened to almost everyone because research showed that as children, we are born with the ability of asking numerous questions. Um, in, a, in a classical study that's published in 2007, a group of psychologists, they, they are a little bit crazy, and they actually analyzed the transcript, meaning that everything for children from the age of a little more than one year old, just after they learn how to speak, to about a little bit older than five years old, in these four years, they actually recorded every single conversation made by these four children with uh, their mothers. And they analyzed, the, or, or they, they spent years and years analyzing the content of the dialogues. And they found out that on average, they asked more than 100 questions every hour. By the time they were five years old, they have asked more than 10,000 questions different questions, right? not repeating the same questions. That's amazing, isn't it, right? So we're all born with lots of, lots of questions, or the ability of asking lots of questions. But something happened. Something seriously has happened. When these when this children, including yourself when you were young, grow a little bit older, more than 60 years old, 
something amazing, subtle, but significant has, has happened to them. So for example, this in another, in another report, um, psychologists were measuring something called episodes of curiosity, meaning that a question or even a look or um, a statement that point out you didn't understand something, right? A kind of request for more information, episode of curiosity. Before a kid, when, when, a kid, when kids were in kindergarten, they recorded a two hour period, they showed a certain number of curious, curious episodes. But when the same kids were in the fifth grade, the number of evidence, the evidence of curiosity have dropped by five times. So it doesn't make sense, right? When you're older, you're exposed to more new things and you're a little bit more knowledgeable, you should, have, you, you should be able to ask even more questions, isn't it? But instead, no, you stop asking questions. By the time these people become young adults, um, they, don't, they didn't ask questions at all. They basically, um, um, they don't do that. It's really, really um, to me, one of the saddest and most significant observations for um, child for for, um, for um, um, in education, when a kid was young, when it, whenever he see, see a door, a closed door, and there's a room behind it, the kid will always want to open the door. They want to open the door. They want to push open it. Even if the door is locked, they will kick the door and try to open the door. And they because they're curious about what's inside. But when they're older, they didn't care. Right? There are numerous closed doors um, in, um, in, uh, at home and in, in, in school. They didn't care what's behind the door. When they're even older, such as me, I'm a little bit afraid of that door. Right? <laughs> I, 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 um, yeah, I, I didn't care about what's inside. In, in fact, I didn't want to open it. Right? I, I, I don't know who's inside. So this kind of subtle change of this subtle change of um, um, uh, this subtle, subtle change of things. Um, um, is, um, uh, to me, is very, very important. Why is, why is it happened? Something between kindergarten and fifth grade, what happened? Well, one of the things that, that um, we, can, um, we can imagine is um, that those children went to school, right? So when they're, when they're in school, they're in a different environment, and the teachers were supposed to um, enhance their curiosity, right? Or every single education research paper on education that I've read, and thousands and thousands of them, stated, concluded beyond any doubt that curiosity is the most, is the most important motivi motivi motiv um, motivation factor for, for learning, right? We all agree, the universal consensus. Every single teacher I talked to said he or she will spend their whole life stimulating curiosity in their students. But what they did was precisely opposite. Because they quickly find out that curious kids are difficult. Curious children ask too many questions. When they ask too many questions in class, they're disrupting the class, right? They're disrupting the syllabus. And in a way, syllabus is just like a, it's just a elaborate script towards standard examination. And any challenge or deviation from, deviation from that script is to be punished, stigmatized, and discouraged. Children love to seek at those assurance and, um, and their approval. So very, very quickly, we learn that those students, those students who shut up and listen and do their homework, we, got, we get all the brownie points. And the students who ask questions about why the sky blue and things like that will be asked to shut up. Of course, we, we all learn to shut up. The incentive of being approved is so strong that we have to bury our curiosity under the, under the carpet. We, we destroyed our own curiosity. I teach in a university, and um, it's not that not sitting you. Um, I teach in a university, and the students who came to our class, so they're university students, right? The students who came to our class, they're, 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 the fact that they, entered, they, can, they could enter university is a proof that these people are not time wasters, they're not troublemakers. They are champions of conformity. They are the people who get all the brownie points. They're the people who learn how to shut up because they did well in exam examination and came to our university. Um, I, one of the hobbies, I, I want to talk to students and chat with students. And, um, um, and a few years ago, I started to have a hobby. 
and the whole bee is um, to chat with them, and I, 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 can, I can see that they have zero curiosity. They just they didn't care, right? If I teach a lecture and I drop my trousers, they, they didn't, what? I, I don't care, and they just keep on um, writing on their, on their computers. That's not supposed to be, right? Because these, these are young people, they are, these are 19, 20 years old people. They should be curious about everything under the sun. So I start to have a conversation with them, and I start to ask them um, what their life and their, their childhood. And I find that whenever I ask them to imagine that moment, just like what I, what I asked you to do a few minutes ago, that moment that you asked the questions but didn't get an answer to, or the moment you ask a question when you're a child and you got punished. Whenever I ask that, bring that up, the student become very, very um, interested and engaging. So a few years ago, it became a hobby, and then it turned out to be to become a, my mission to talk to as many university students as possible and collect the question they asked about science when they, when they were children. So let's look at some of them. So these questions are asked by actually real people, right? So they're real people, Socrates, rule number one, right? They're real. Um, these questions are all very interesting, right? When we look at these questions, um, I have three observations. The first observation is these questions that are collected, I, I, I got hundreds of them, are very, very precious evidence, are evidence of a very, very precious moment of these young people's life when they were a kid and they're full of curiosity. Um, the second observation is, um, this is also a sad, kind of a, it, it's kind of a poetry of sadness, right? Because this question represents something they lost um, when they grew up. The third observation is being a scientist, when I look at this question, you know, some of the questions are very, very laughable, right? But some of the questions are, to me, deeply profound. These questions are, actually quite interesting to me as a scientist. And um, they are <coughs> gateways to numerous scientific discovery. Right? But these questions are asked by three or four years old. So um, a few years ago, about three years ago, I started to ask these students, well, not only about their question, but the following question. Would you like to? look for answers to this question, right? If the answer didn't exist, would you like to become a scientist yourself and answer to your own questions, right? Most of the students said, oh, come on, you're crazy. I'm busy, right? Um, I have um, <laughs> examination to do, right? uh, don't, don't, please, don't, um, please don't call me. But there, are, but there are always some of them, right? There are always a handful of them who said, yes, I would like to find out, for example, what make a plant move. I would like to find this out. So we um, organized a um, program, research program, and this research program is called um, Addicted to Discovery. So the program is very, the idea is very, very simple, right? The idea is, if you are, it's actually written here, it's, a, it's our website. The idea is, if you are, if you are a kid, and you, if you ask a question when you're a kid, and some teacher told you to shut up and don't waste your time, if you have a time machine and travel back in time and talk to yourself as a little kid, what would, what would you have tell him or her, right? So, of course, you would say that, well, first of all, you would say that um, um, it's okay, right? it's, it's a great question. Second of all, um, nobody knows the answer, it doesn't matter, because most scientific discovery came from questions nobody can answer. So that was, to me, a gift I allow these students to give themselves when they're younger, right? So basically, a bit of time traveling there. Addicted to discover it because we, we think if we, as a university, fully endorse these students, allow them to go and find out answer to their own question, even though some sometime in the primary school a teacher told them not to do that, it's almost like a revenge, right, to that to those insensitive teachers. And we want to do that, right? we want revenge. And if we kind of have the revenge, if the student can go back to the earlier curious time when they can ask numerical questions. But now they can ask numerical questions as students, as 
treasuries, as people who are contributing to the society. Maybe we can change our society in some small way by doing that. So we have this um, program launched in 2013, <coughs> and it's fantastic. The students, when they are allowed to answer their own question, the question they ask when they're, when they're a kid, we run, we run workshop and teach them how to read scientific literature to determine which part of the question has been answered previously, which is the existing knowledge gap, so that they can do and design experiment to answer the part that they have no answer to. So we find that when, when you allow the student to do that, they, they change into monsters. So I'm going to tell you a few examples. Right? So one day, we have a workshop on teaching students how to read scientific literature. And then a girl came up to me. And the girl is actually the girl who asked the question, what make a pine move? So and she said, um, Dr. Lam, um, I'm interested in plant movement. Um, have you seen a plant that wave at you when you talk to it? I said, a plant that wave at you when you talk to it? Say it again. A plant that wave at you when you talk to it? I said, it's impossible, right? A plant cannot listen to you. It has no uh, sensation to sound, let alone movement. And then, say, and, then, and, then, and then she went home. And then next Monday, she showed me this clip, right? So I'm going to play uh, this, this clip. I'm going to, I, I would like to ask you to watch the video about 10 seconds long. And not only watch the, the clip, maybe the clip is not so interesting, but I want to listen to the audio. Huh? Yeah. Hey. Uh. So listen, listen, look at this leaf. There's no wind, right? Because there's a lot of wind. That's the girl. Even if you couldn't understand what they said, you can sense their voice, right? The joy and the excitement. <laughs> That's true, right? They, shot, they, they were shot in the, in the country park. <laughs> you are, so basically, she showed me that, and, and then I said, my, my mouth dropped on the floor. <laughs> oh, then the professor in me came back, right? I'm a professor, and I, I, I want to teach. I want to teach, and I, I said to her, well, do you know the first scientist who ever studied plant movement it was actually Charles Darwin, who happened to um, discover evolution. And then she said, yeah, 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 I know that. Um, he wrote a book called The Power of Movement of Plants um, in 1880 uh, with his son. And the, the PDF of the book is available on the website, and I read it last week. It's not my plant. <laughs> that student is in her first year student. She's not even a biology student. As a, as a college professor who have difficulty asking my student to read even the one A4 page of nature notes, <laughs> it's amazing. The thirst of this student to, to know what this plan is, is unstoppable. She, she read their own book, she create her own education. And then I told her that, well, I don't know what species it is, and the way to do that is to do something called DNA barcoding, where you look at the DNA and the sequence of DNA, and then you know what species is it. I want to do that. Well, but you are not a biology student. To do DNA barcoding, you first to go to second year and learn genetics. And, but before genetics, you need to learn organic chemistry to study DNA um, chemistry. And then you have also need to learn mitochondria and the rate of mutation. I can't wait for two years, she said. I have to do it now because I cannot think about, I cannot stop thinking about this plant. She did DNA barcoding. Um, she went to a lab. She learned everything PCR. Um, she did the experiment herself. She, um, the plant is in, in the country park. She went to the country park and cut off some plant, which is illegal, by the way. <laughs> and she extracted DNA. She did everything by herself. We now know what species it is, and she's still working on this project. Don't you see something, something amazing is happening? This is another student. Um, he um, is not her. She's, um, and, uh, she's a friend who's demonstrating this thing. Um, she's, he's interested in 
um, how virtual reality is kind of help um, encouraging people to do more exercise. In two months, he learned how to build the whole thing. The whole thing was built by him of uh, robotics. Um, he wrote code to make virtual reality programs all made by him. We didn't teach him anything. In fact, we didn't give him any money to do that. No, there's no incentive. The incentive is our um, is, a, is the fact that we allow him to, to do that. Is another um, another student um, working on um, an organism called slime mode. Um, um, the slime mode will crawl to the food, right? But if you give give them three different types of food with different flavor, which one will, will he choose? Um, that's that's the experiment, and she did the time lapse movie by herself. The students start to, this is from the, from the guy who asked about um, why, what, make, what make insects attracted to the light. Um, they write magazine articles. Um, we didn't tell them to do that, right? They, they read so much that they became experts in this field. Um, they discover, um, I'm, I'm sorry, it's in Chinese, uh, Chinese newspaper. They discover anti-cancer compounds in vegetables. They got reported in, um, a magazine, education magazine. Um, basically, we call it um, Hong Kong's education of, of overall. This, um, okay, this, um, um, this all really, really a great experience for me. It's almost like it changed my life, right? Um, we now, I now believe that there's something wrong with our education system, right? This is, if, if you remember one thing in my talk, I, I want, I want you to remember this. Um, our education systems celebrate answers. We are all, um, we all, um, we have to stop now, right? But then the questions, um, I think, is more important, right? We should award students who ask the right questions, and um, um, and not the one who come up with the expected answer. So I'm sorry about this two minutes um, overrun, but um, thank you very much for for your attention and. Um, <laughs>